taking a look here at a backhand swing between myself and one of my students. What's really interesting about this, it's, it's a left-hander. So always coaching left-hander is interesting and it poses up a few different challenges. But here's some of the common faults that I notice. I always like to try and toggle it where we, we're meeting the ball at roughly about the same place. So it's going to be around about there because then there's, there's quite a nice symmetry between a couple of things. Okay, so let me talk about this initial setup. So I'm a big, big fan of what I call the one, two, three part of the swing. Whereas my swing starts at one, it then actually drops around my shoulder, gets down to number two, where my racket goes a little bit horizontal, and then it moves forward to three. Let's have a look at what I mean with that. So there's one, there's two, and you see that racket's nice and horizontal, and then it moves to three to meet that contact point. So that one, two, three part of the swing is really good for getting some body weight, getting some momentum behind the ball, and just the general shape of the swing is really important. So let's have a look at my student on the left now. Let's have a notice where he's at. So his position one, it's kind of okay. It's almost there. So he's in that decent position one. I'm hoping position two comes around there and let's see what happens. And then look, you'll notice that position two is almost missed out. He's going straight from number one to number three, which is a little bit of a direct swing. Look how steep that is. And what that does, it just, it, it pretty much means that the arm is taking up too much of the heavy lifting. All of the arm is just doing the work. Whereas if you look at mine on the right, because of the shape of the swing, it actually gets my hips going, it gets my shoulders going, gets my back hip going. There's a lot more body momentum into that shot with that shape of the swing. If you just watch my shoulder position here, you see how it's down and then it drives through. All of that momentum is what allows me to hit the ball. Whereas in my student, it's all pretty much through the arm. Okay, one of the big things I noticed, you're probably having a look at this on the left-hand screen. I call it the swan neck. So if you just look at how much he's bending his wrist there, he's having to really pull his wrist around to get some power. A couple of reasons that this happens. First thing, it's because of the lack of the one, two, three part of his swing. Because only going from one to three, the wrist has to actually kind of move more and engage to be able to whip that racket head through. So that's the first big thing. Second thing, it's all to do with his positioning and his spacing on the ball. If you'll see there, that ball, he's a bit too close and he's actually behind the ball a little, a little bit. So let me just go back and show you what I'm trying to get at here. So if that's the contact point, what I tend to do is I tend to trust that that ball comes back in line with my knee underneath my eye level. Whereas if you look at my student there, if I just draw a line by where his foot is, that ball seems a good foot, maybe half a foot in front and he's going and he's searching for it. I call this a searching swing where He's trying to reach, he's trying to search, and this is not ideal because there's so much less control. You're having to steer the ball, you're losing the body weight. So that's a big, big point there about why that swan neck comes in, that real wobbly wrist. Another thing I call it, it's, it's the rusty swinging gait. I know it doesn't sound too complimentary here, but then that, that, that wrist becomes like a, like a hinge on a swinging gait, and it just doesn't have that much control. I also like to use this frame quite a lot. So... Let me just try to get it back to where it was. So that's about the contact point there. Let me just get it back around about there. So at this part of the swing, let's just have a look about here. So what you'll notice, if you just look at my fingers there, you'll probably see that the top part of my fingers, I'm seeing his knuckles. I'm seeing, I'm seeing his, his racket and his whole hand turning towards the camera and even more so in that frame there. Because at the moment, if you look at the flatness I've got there, and how the wrist and the forearm and the elbow and even the racket head starting to look upwards, that's where you want to be a little bit more. This is getting closer to that second part of the swing. Whereas if you look at the student there, that whole racket face is looking back towards the camera, that wrist is turned towards the camera. So that racket face then has to do a hell of a lot of work to get back around to make contact. And that's not going to be ideal. That's going to be pretty inconsistent at that point. So that's a big thing that I would look to try and change. We did quite a lot of this afterwards, so we made some decent changes. A couple of little pointers to, to make notes of here. What I, I like, I actually really like his elbow position there, nice angle. Mine's got a similar angle, but here's the big thing. The thing is, let's have a look at how much tighter my elbow is closer to my body as opposed to the student. His has got a lot of clearance there. I'm a big fan of being a little bit closer, a little bit tighter, having these areas nice and compact like a coil spring. I talk a lot about a coil spring when you're lining up for that backhand. Whereas if you look at my student, I don't think he's coiled enough. You know, if, if you're just looking at my, my chest area, you can almost just see the little logo of my shirt and my whole chest area. It's looking backwards, isn't it? Whereas if you look at his, 
his chest is almost a little bit too open to start. It's facing that side wall. So there's going to be more reliance on the hand and the arm. And so what I would suggest is that he brings his elbow in a bit tighter, even dips his shoulder underneath his chin a little bit more. As you can see there, my shoulder is, is coming underneath my chin. So that for me would be another way to make the swing slightly more compact and to also reduce that twiddly wrist. Okay, so a couple of good things. Like, you know, there's actually, I've been pointing out kind of all the stuff that he needs to work on, but look, we got a good, like our lunges are relatively similar size. His is probably a little bit bigger than mine. There's a good body position. He's trying to give the ball lots of space in this direction, but not quite getting it right in this direction. What I really like is his follow through. I'm just going to talk about his follow through for a second. So if you notice my follow through goes all the way up to the ceiling, you notice the top of the racket there. Same with his, it's pointing up towards that ceiling. That's a really good symmetry. He's thrown his racket, he let it go. So that's a real good positive. I'm a really big fan of that follow through going. So that's what's giving that ball that little bit of punch. If we can correct all of this stuff and get him a bit better there, that's gonna help a lot. And just the other thing I'm gonna point out that might just be a slight concern. Let's watch the back foot slide. So you see my back foot there compared to his back foot. Let's watch what happens. Look how his one goes all the way onto the floor. He's having to like almost throw his shoelaces onto this, the floor. His knee's getting really down. And okay, that's okay at times, but it just looks a little bit harder than it should be. If you look at my one there, my, my tip of my toe stays. And actually what I'll be doing sometimes is the inner side of my shoe. Just that inner bit where, where the shoe's built up a little bit in squash shoes. There's that, just that little bit of extra protection that will start to slide on the floor. Because I think he's a little bit too low and compact there. And that might be a little bit harder to get out. There's also a possibility that he gets there because of, let's just watch how that ball drops a little bit. So I'm trying to take the ball almost at the peak of the bounce. Maybe it's just dropping off the peak. Whereas what's the trajectory of when he hits, it droops quite a lot. So let's go back a couple of frames. Can you see that there? So it's almost drooping a lot. So I'd like him to meet the ball around about there now, like really making contact a little bit earlier. Let me just try and show that. Yep. So there, that's going to be key. So let me just use the bounce as an example. I also like to toggle it with this. So the ball's bounced around the same point. Okay. It's bounced slightly differently, but look at how I'm meeting that ball much earlier. So that's the, you know, the ball's bounced the same. I've already met the ball and just notice, look how far away his racket is still from that ball at about the same point it bounced, which I think is really interesting sometimes. Yes. I know it's not exactly the same part, but I would like to get him to drive forward meet that ball on the rise. And that also helps a lot with things. So some a couple of little key tips here, you know, we worked on this soon afterwards and there were some good improvements. So I hope that helps and please do share and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Cheers.